with the Indigenous Community Healing Group in Redfern. Callan works to build a bridge between Indigenous practice, wisdom and evidence-based practice. And his training in DBT, behaviour therapy, with people at risk of suicide and self-harm. Callan also is a teacher in the Catholic system in Canberra. Callan's presentation will go for about an hour and we'll have a short break and resume for discussion and question. Note that we'll be recording this event for later reference. And if you're here on Zoom, please remain muted with Carol, when Carol, while Carolyn is speaking. Use Zoom chat for comments and we'll open up later for discussion. Thank you, Carolyn. Great to have you here tonight. Thank you so much, Jean. It's lovely to be here. It really means a lot to me to be here. Um, this work's been a real slow and steady journey. And I did present on this, I think it was about eight years ago in this room, um, we did a meditation practice in a, sitting in a circle. Um, so if that's okay as part of our discussion, if that's all right with everyone, um, we'd like to regroup the chairs in a circle, in the learning circle of this, the style that the, the healing group um, in Redfern um, is um, the formation for that discussion group um, so we can get a, a little bit of an experience of the um, learning and healing circle um, as it's practiced in Redfern. Um, so it also means a lot to me to be here because this is a work in progress that I'm hoping um, to get to Masters by Research level. So I'm really looking forward to feedback and I'll take that on board quite seriously and um, think about where to go next with, with this work. So the first slide, I think, um, introduces the gravity of this work. Um, this image is the memorial to... Cassius Turvey at the Aboriginal Ten Embassy on the 1st of November last year. And um, like that ominous um, sky being present at that, I don't know if people remember that from the media last year um, in Western Australia, a young boy um, who, who was killed, beaten up, um, in clearly racially motivated attack. Um, and the tragedy of that and the heaviness of that for the Indigenous communities and the, the way, the generosity of spirit to the way that, that Cassius's mother responded and, and spoke about the need for forgiveness and understanding. Um, it's really an honour to be able to be present. Um, and that was quite a spontaneous coming together of community at that event. And I think... Um, to be, to be working in the healers, healing space um, and developing, working with emerging therapies, it, it can be a really difficult thing to know that whatever we do, there's, there's going to be this certain level of violence in the Australian community at this particular point in, in our history um, that, that somehow we have to stand up to. Um, and the training I'm doing is um, in dialectical behaviour therapy uh, is it's a therapy designed for um, people at risk of suicide. So obviously when we get a, a random attack, like what happened with um, Cassius Turvey, and so there's some more people coming in at the yeah. um, It's very, very demoralising because there's this not a lot we can do other than come together um, across culture and try to support each other and try to heal and try to... Um, to develop, I, I guess, the, just to be able to speak and connect and, and develop our understanding of how to support each other. So um, now that one disclaimer I want to make is I'm not, I'm not practicing, I'm training as a therapist, I'm not practicing as a therapist other than volunteer work. Um, and I'm not Jungian trained, however, um, in engaging with the Jungian Society, I've found it a very, very valuable space for my own healing. And I'd like to acknowledge Kirsten too, the wonderful work that you're doing in the meditation group at the moment. Found that very supportive of, of this work. So the mandalas, um, understanding more and more about Jungian practice, about how he approached his own healing and, um, and how he worked 
through becoming more grounded, I guess, and being able to, to, to um, explore visuals and symbol, symbols to be able to get a, a deeper sense of presence um, and integration. Um, so on the next slide, um, is a quote from Jung. Um, I struggled a bit to sort of find a bridge between Jung and, and working with the Indigenous practice wisdom. And I thought perhaps this idea of the numinous seemed to be the best place to, to kind of find, find a way across. So Jung defines the numinous as inexpressible, mysterious, terrifying, directly experienced and pertaining only to the divinity. So I, I just really sat with that and had a think about um, the work I'll show you a little bit later. We'll go back to this definition, um, looking at the, the experience of the welcome to country at the indigenous led suicide prevention conferences, which I was fortunate um, to be part of a team presenting at those conferences. And um, I think the experience of being in a, in a ceremonial space that held that grief of, of the loss of the, the wave of suicides in Indigenous communities that has hit Australia in, in such high numbers. Um, that, that seemed to be that, that that idea of the numinous really spoke to that, that connection. Um, so we'll come back and revisit that later um, in the presentation. Thanks, Trish. So I'd like to acknowledge the work of Aunty Miriam Rose Angamar Borman. I don't know if anyone remembers, she was the Senior um, Australian of the Year in 2021 and came to Canberra and to accept her um, that recognition um, as part of the Australia Day ceremonies um, at that time. Um, so Didiri, deep listening is ancient wisdom practice and it has been renewed in contemporary Indigenous culture culture by Auntie Miriam Rose under my Borman. Dadiri helps us to understand how to walk between worlds and connect with our deeper purpose in life through listening and finding our connection to nature and community. And so I highly recommend if you want to learn more about this work, there's quite a few resources online now. And um, the go-to go website is the Miriam Rose Foundation. Yes. Um, Michael Jackson. My name is Michael uh, Jackson. Next slide. My name is Michael Jackson. My name so is Michael Deep Listening provides Michael. guidance for being present, listening, connecting to country, understanding seasonal change, understanding the connection between people and being connected, knowing how to grieve and pay respects, Hi, respect when Jackson. people pass, and knowing what to do and when. Um, so in my training, I've, I've trained in acceptance and commitment therapy and dialectical behaviour therapy, which are both therapies that have mindfulness practice at the core. Um, the deity, I think, is also equally um, alongside the Western behavioural science, a profound technology for mindfulness and, and dropping into present awareness. And it's the only one I know of that really unpacks that, that space around, around how to behave when people pass, um, how to do sorry business, how to, um, Miriam Rose in her lectures talks about this quite significant ways in which I think that can be a gap within Western psychology, not necessarily always, but, but I think there's, there's a depth there that um, around acknowledging the work, the work of grief and what to do at times of loss. And, and the term sorry business just carries a whole lot of meaning. I think that we, we don't, certainly in my culture, um, English and Irish culture, we don't have language around that, that the work of that time of, of grieving. Dadidi provides an experiential framework for approaching cross-cultural awareness with respect for the trauma of colonisation and the need for trauma-responsive dialogue. So as part of my journey with this work, I've been studying um, trauma-responsive practice through 
um, the Creative Therapies Certificate at Charles Darwin Uni. And these are some of the, the things that we looked at um, that form the basis of our scientific knowledge around um, how to manage trauma. So, so just a reminder about um, the different parts of our brain. Um, this is something I really love using with children, trying to convince them that that really, if they're losing it, they're um, losing it and going into that fight or flight space, um, that, that it is not the most efficient part of the brain that they're operating in, that they're um, locked in a more simple, emotive place once they're angry and that it is possible to step back from that. So the next slide um, looks a bit at Dan Siegel's. I don't know if anyone's seen Dan Siegel's model on the brain. It's a good one to use with kids at school. So um, just that reminder that, um, huh, so we've got representation for the limbic, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and if we flip our lids, <laughs> that's, that's when our prefrontal cortex isn't operating so well, and um, we need to come back bring bring all of our awareness back together to be able to make conscious decisions about what to do next and how to solve the problem. Thanks. So here we've got the six principles of trauma-informed practice. So this was um, part of the, the basis of what, what we studied. Um, so the, the creative therapies diploma at Charles Darwin Uni, it's mostly taught from an Indigenous pedagogy's perspective and we have Indigenous lecturers um, this one unit looked um, linked straight to the international guidelines from SAMHSA on trauma-informed practice. So you've got the principles of safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment and choice, and cultural, historical and gender issues. So the next six slides just cover um, a kind of a reflective um, photo journal that I've done to unpack um, sort of my journey with these different principles in trauma-informed practice. The safety, the first, um, first most important thing to be able to work together in community. Um, this um, Tony Lee is who's one of our lecturers in the diploma um, in creative therapies, um, an Indigenous leader in the Northern Territory. Um, talks, taught us a lot about the practices of walking on country and the importance of going up and introducing ourselves to trees. So this is something, even though I love trees and I hang around them, I had never gone up to one before and, and actually introduced myself. So this was a big challenge. Um, and this is a picture of a beautiful, most beautiful old trees in the domain in Sydney. Um, so something that I did as part of this training with, within Indigenous pedagogy, is it loud enough, Robert? No, <laughs> that's better. Something I did um, as part of learning about Indigenous ways of seeing and being um, was being able to consciously do that and spend more time with trees and, and speak to them. Um, next one is trustworthiness. So I chose a symbol that connects the heart and the written word, paying attention to how we communicate the differences between oral and written communication, an important part of the journey between cultures. I come from a Western English background where the written word is privileged. And when I'm working with Indigenous communities, I pay attention to what is missed when we focus on the written word. Um, so Dadiri is an important methodology for being able to balance this, this, this inequality between the written and the oral traditions. Next one is peer support. So this to me is um, represents playfulness, adventure and connection. And uh, it's a very important part of my, my own healing and practice as a teacher. And this was a chalk drawing of the owl and the pussycat that I did as part of um, Steiner education training last year. So this to me just kind of sums up the importance of, of that, that sense of fun and being being with people. Next one, um, collaboration and mutuality. This is a picture photo of a collection bowl featuring the figures of six people. You can see that 
holding hands and as a reminder of the importance of community. And this was taken at the Quaker House in Sydney Meditation Hall, which was part of my meditation journey last year. Next one, empowerment, voice and choice. This tapestry was worked on collectively as part of a Salvation Army first floor program um, with the, the, the VIFS group, which stands for Very Important People, and it's a support group for families impacted by a loved one with mental illness and or addiction. Being given the opportunity um, to make a choice, even with something small like a piece of material, creates a space where people needing support can begin to feel valued and respected as individuals with hopes, dreams and goals, rather than being seen, seen as victims of past trauma. Uh, the next one is cultural, historical and gender issues. And I chose this image of a flooded road near Melagen as a metaphor for overwhelming change. There are times and processes in history that can overwhelm us as individuals and it can be difficult to unravel the impact of big events such as war, economic crisis, family illness, conflict, and the impact of restrictive gender roles. Um, next slide. So keeping research on track has formed the basis of um, how I've been thinking about how to approach this, um, this research. It's um, up till now has only been a kind of a dialogue project, um, kind of a, a space where we share skills and engage in, I guess, trying to build a bridge between cultures. Um, and so this document from the National Health and Medical Research Council um, would form the basis of any further research. Um, so we, we hold these values um, at the core of the work. So spirit, spirit and integrity, cultural continuity, equity, reciprocity, respect and responsibility. And um, when I look at comparing acceptance and commitment therapy with Dadiri deep listening, uh, it works pretty particularly well to work with, with values because values forms one of the, the six processes in ACT. So um, that's been a particularly useful way to raise those Indigenous values up and to think about how that works in practice has um, been a really helpful way to create that bridge across culture. Next one. Um, so this is um, the ATSIS PEP Indigenous Suicide Prevention Conference from 2018. Um, so the first, the inaugural conference that that was Indigenous led um, took place in 2016 in Alice Springs. Um, the next slide is a picture of the opening ceremony at um, ATSIS PEP 2018. So this was a really significant event because we had both the second national um, ATSIS PEP conference and the second international conference um, taking place in Perth. And this slide just gives you a little bit of an idea of this, um, it's quite an extraordinary, profound kind of holding space, this, this welcome to country that took place on, on Scarborough Beach. And um, I'm just thinking back also to um, that idea of the numinous that we talked about earlier. So Jung's definition of the numinous, numinous, inexpressible, mysterious, terrifying, directly experienced, pertaining only to divinity. So both this ceremony and, um, and the first ceremony, um, which I haven't, haven't recorded by photos, but the first ceremony at the um, inaugural Francis Pep Conference, the Welcome to Country was done by Rosalie um, Kunoth Monks, who's an elder who's since passed, who many people in the older generation might remember from the first, she was one of the first Indigenous women actors in, um, um, sorry, the name of the film escapes me, but um, quite a famous um, Australian 
film, which was one of the, the first films that portrayed Indigenous people on, in the cinema. Um, so her Welcome to Country was quite an extraordinary, just this image still of it was at the, the conference centre just through the gap in Alice Springs and the, the, the hills there that, that she talked about the caterpillar dreaming and, the, and you see the, the, the hills of the, the folds of the hills. There's something very holding about that, that sense of country um, as being changing and part of the story. And, and somehow this created a space where somehow it was possible to bear the, the pain of looking at the, the enormity, I think, of the problem of Indigenous suicide in this country um, within those spaces that were created through those welcomed countries. Um, so, yeah, as Jung says, inexpressible, I think. There's, there's something about when, when cultures collide and, and when we have a chance to open up and attempt to communicate the inexpressible in that kind of space and attempt to face um, the, the damage and the ongoing trauma of colonisation. Um, I, think, I think for me that was as close as I can think of as, as an ex expression of the numinous, of, of that sense of that that ineffable sense of the sacred being present in that space. Next one. So this is our research team, uh, just the three of us there. The, um, there were some other presenters there as well. So Amy Bain is an Indigenous social worker who I studied with at Charles Sturt Uni on the left, and that's myself on the right, and Ken Zolomoski in the centre, who's a... Um, cultural consultant based in Sydney, and he is one of the founders of Gamrata Indigenous Healing Group, which takes place on Monday evenings in Redfern. And so this is the group that, we're, um, that I've been um, participating in and working with to, um, to broaden their, um, I guess, their, their safety and their protocols around being able to work with um, non-Indigenous psychologists and being able to find, create this bridge between the, the Didiri practice, the deep listening practice, and the Western models like ACT and DBT. Um, next one. So mind, body, spirit. These are some of the notes that, that I took that um, I guess form the core of this work. So understanding Dadil as heart, mind, body, and connection. And um, we're looking at ways how we can explain DBT. <laughs> it's not, um, it's based on Zen practice and on the work of Marsha Lin Um And she's a Catholic psychologist in the US and um, a very profound deep thinker in terms of how, how to bring that sense of deep presence um, into, into the healing work. Um, so we talked about Didiri, Didiri, belonging and trust and determination being the important things that we needed to do to be able to create that, that bridge between um, dialectical behaviour therapy and Didiri deep listening. So the next, next few slides are um, just some looks at how to create safe environments. So these are taken from some school materials. So these are the kinds of things that we practice in the group and we train ourselves in. So that stepping back, um, reminding us so that one of the important skills in um, DBT is in a crisis, don't make things worse. So just being able to develop that, that skill of being able to step back, take a breath, remember that, that safety is important, that the safety of, of everyone in the space. Counting slowly. So these are the kind of skills that we really need in, from a trauma-informed perspective um, to, be, to be practiced and learnt and taught and um, to develop some currency with this. 
And these are the kinds of skills that, that the group, the healing group in Redfern were incredibly skilled at and really patient with this, this sense that even though there's, there's this turmoil of trauma that can open up at, at different times and, and it's easy to get sucked into that, um, it's also possible to have that reminder of stepping back and being able to stay safe and calm and remind others of that importance of being able to stay safe. Um, so, and the next one is, yeah, this is the work of Sulaki. So just some, some really basic little reminders for teachers, using a calm voice, giving processing time, slowing it down, breaking it down, achievable steps. Not necessarily trying to reason in a crisis as well, or if someone's elevated, remembering that, that there's that stepping back, decreasing the sensory stimulation, avoiding sort of buying into the battle, trying to create this third space, I guess, a space of healing, space where, where it's possible to create some other outcome. And I think about this in terms of um, the extraordinary work that Nikolai presented about Alice Springs um, earlier in this year here. Um, that, that sense that within that crisis of, of intergenerational violence and trauma that's been handed down in a, in a place like Alice Springs, that, um, yeah, I guess the, the, there's a sense of hope in, in the, the, these skills it's possible to teach and to learn these skills and to practice them and to find ways to create change. So, yeah, I think actually that's, we've come to the end. Yeah, there's some references there that you might find helpful. Mary, um, Mary Rose Angamar Borman has done um, a talk on a yarn on the Beyond Blue website. So if you'd like to know more about how that conversation's happening about the application of um, Tadiri for trauma recovery and in the mental health space, that resource can be a really good place to go. And the other um, academic I'd really like to acknowledge is Professor Judy Atkinson, uh, whose work, Trauma Trails, Recreating Songlines, The Transgenerational Effects of Trauma in Indigenous Australia. That's an incredibly groundbreaking book. And Annie Judy went up to see uh, Annie Miriam up in Darwin, in, and she's about three hours away from Darwin, I think, um, to ask permission to use Dadiri for trauma recovery. And she's done some extraordinary work traveling around the country and and creating processes to apply this work in, in practical ways, which we'll get to experience something of after the break. So, yep. so short and sweet tonight. So we get an early um, supper break and then we'll reconvene um, in a circle. Actually, I've met um, Dr. Miriam Rose from Darwin, um, Darwin last year at, at the conference. She came along to the language conference that I attended last year. And she's actually quite an amazing lady. <coughs> she became the first Aboriginal teacher in the 70s in Darwin, in, in the Northern Territory. She was um, involved with um, working with the Department of Education there in um, stimulating people to run art courses to became an art um, consultant going around. So quite an amazing story that she had. She came along and spoke at the conference. So it was pretty amazing. So um, I have great memories of her. So I'd like to um, have a, to come and have our supper. We actually have something special to do um, because we're, it's our friend's 60th birthday. Uh, Robbie <laughs> Tulip's birthday. So we have um, to keep on celebrating because flame and then bring the fire up to your face. Place your palms over the face to connect with the fire energy. 
With the fire energy, we associate the characteristics of discipline, leadership, enthusiasm, passion, willpower, commitment, compassion, and love. When you are ready, separate the fingers, open up your eyes, and come back to the room. <coughs> Auntie Miriam Rose Gadiri Reflections. The word, concept, and spiritual practice that is Gadiri is from the Nang Kinku and Ninging Bumari languages of the Aboriginal peoples of the Daly River region, Northern Territory, Australia. Nagin Kinku means deep water sounds. Nagin Kurunka is the name of my tribe. The word can be broken up into three parts. Naginyi means word or sound. Kuri means water. And ka means deep. So the name, the deep water sounds or sounds of the deep. The Didiri reflection is about tapping into that deep spring that is within us. Many Australians understand that Aboriginal people have a special respect for nature. The identity Aboriginal people have with the land is sacred and unique. Many people are beginning to understand this more. Also, there are many Australians who appreciate that Aboriginal people have a very strong sense of community. All persons matter. All of us belong, and there are many more Australians now who understand that we are a people who celebrate together. A special quality of my people that I believe is the most important and our most unique gift, perhaps the greatest gift we can give to our fellow Australians. In our language, this quality is called Dadiri. It is inner, deep listening and quiet, still awareness. When I experience Dardiri, I am made whole again. I can sit on the riverbank or walk through the trees. Even if someone close to me has passed away, I can find my peace in this silent awareness. There is no need of words. A big part of the diri is listening. Through the years, we have listened to our stories. They are told and sung over and over as the seasons go by. Today, we still gather around the campfires and together we hear the sacred stories. As we grow older, we ourselves become the storytellers. We pass on to the young ones all they must know. The stories and songs sink quietly into our minds and we hold them deep inside. In the ceremonies, we celebrate the awareness of our lives as sacred. Yes, uh, the theme for me that was coming through was very much this kind of um, Indigenous spiritual practice coming into the white community after years and years and years of doing Hindu meditation or Buddhist meditation, and you think it's something that other people did and we've kind of heard about. But now we're hearing that right here on this land of Australia, or what we call Australia, um, uh, this, these practices of uh, Indigenous, as it were, um, in a broad sense, to our community today, no matter what our ethnic background might be. So looking at the pictures going on up there on the screen, I was thinking, how are you going to transfer that, what was going on on the screen, to what we're going to experience? And of course, we've just done it. And that kind of, uh, there's a sharing, um, a community of thinking going on in the circle, and this uh, circle of meditation type practice that you know comes from other uh, forms of meditation that we've learned. Uh, and read about in American books and so on. Never have I seen it in Australian books. And hopefully, since. Well, 
actually there was so much similarities and bringing that one we can be very inclusive society no matter which color which religion which background we are so thank you question about um, school curriculums I'm not sure about. Do you, have you observed anything about school curriculums? It varies a lot, doesn't it? Well, I think it varies from school to school. And the, um, the school where I work at Harrison has 70% um, of the population are from overseas. So we have um, probably a small population of Aboriginal children. But in other, other places like Queanbeyan, um, will be quite a lot more Aboriginal people probably there and in parts of Canberra probably on south side there's a lot more Aboriginal children coming into school so the curriculum would vary depending on the children um, and then the high school level two of um, the curriculum we do have um, resident artists coming to work with students at the school like in our school, we've had resident artists coming in, even with the multicultural aspect of the school. It's still, that's present in the school. We have beautiful murals. And if you go around to some of the schools, you'll see that. And, and they do have um, Aboriginal people at, like um, people at work with the students, but not so much in our school because we have um, a lot of Indian um, and people coming from Africa and people coming in from the, the um, Saudi Arabia and from different places around around the world. So um, it, it's, it'll be depending on um, the areas, I think, depending where they cluster. I think there's quite a, a few Aboriginal families around Narrabunda. I think they do quite a lot of programming there because I, I worked in Narrabunda um, primary school at one stage and they have quite a lot a lot going on in the community I remember going up to Narrabunda shops we had a big function thing going on from all, all the people coming in the communities and different things coming in presenting and doing their thing with the children so yeah so that's really good mm. yeah yeah so Thomas Aquinas um, in Charmwood where I've, I've witnessed I witnessed the grandfather of one of his children doing the smoking ceremony, and that was really beautiful. And there were three generations that were present. There was also one of the staff members um, was part of that family. So I, I think there's a real richness where there is that capacity to um, support the families in the school and give them that space to bring the culture into the school in that way. Yes, I can say at North Ainsley Primary School, there have been particular workshops where Aboriginal elders come in and work with small groups in the school. But the main thing we've done over the last two or three years through the parents and citizens group, there is an Aboriginal liaison officer, one of the people with connections to the school and working closely with them, the school oval, which I think of as a kind of stereotypical Western impost, which was, you know, the grass that had to be mowed or watered and mowed and for playing football or whatever, was transformed into a more accessible area for the students. And so now it has circles of stone that the children can sit and talk and the biggest area actually it's fake grass but there is a small a, a big area that's enough for them to play soccer or ball games but the rest of it is all native plants and there's also been a nursery project involving native plants it's open to the public. Everyone's welcome to go and have a look. And the ACT government is looking at it closely as a model for other areas. So it's like um, 
on the foothills of Mount Ainsley, this sort of Western space has been transformed into something a bit more traditional. And the children love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the fact they can sit and talk in groups, it, it seems to work for them, which is what it's all about. It's lovely. I'd like to make another comment um, and uh, just reflecting on some of the, the conversation. Uh, one, one theme that comes up in connection with the dairy is the sacred. Like what do we consider to be sacred? And I feel that one of, one of the things again that I find really interesting in Carl Jung is uh, he was uh, deeply spiritual, but he, he never called himself a theologian and uh, he was he had a, a real separation from the church and and one of the reasons for that was that the Christian tradition said that uh, God is beyond nature God is above nature that our our spirit is uh, is separate from nature and uh, my sense is that a lot of the indigenous uh, spirituality sees the sacred as uh, within nature so so that whole sense of that when we connect to nature we are connecting to something sacred but that that is an idea that a lot of the european christian theology really lost sight of and there was this sense that we can just destroy nature and it doesn't matter and uh, like we're now reaping the uh, bad consequences of that sort of attitude that's just so, um, uh, uh, it's just viewed with such horror by indigenous spiritual people who, who see the destruction of the sacred as, as just a sort of sacrilege. One of the uh, practice exercises we had to do at uni was to go out into, well, this is in Armidale, so to go out into the grounds of the uni and to find something to bring back to create a concert with, to make a sound with. Uh, and it was a profound experience because we didn't think of using you know, looking at nature as something, being white, we didn't look at nature as being something that was musical. So we were picking up stones and twigs and branches and bits of bushes and that kind of thing. And uh, we had to bring it in and we had to create something out of what we found. And it was really amazing what came out of that. I have to say it as that teacher got up there and conducted us. And it was really quite amazing. We all were very profoundly affected by that. Michael Atherton, if you know Michael Atherton, yeah. Any, yeah. well, he was in my class and uh, oh, yeah. knew him well because yeah. he was a music therapist as well. Yeah. He was the head of school when I was at oh, okay. Sydney. Western Sydney, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I knew him a long time before that. But he, Michael was like a bit of a larrikin in those days. But he, he encouraged us all to go and think creatively outside the square and to be in nature, to sit under a tree and feel the energy of that tree and let nature tell us, how do we make sound of you? How do we sound you? How do we appreciate you with sound? Mm -hmm. So again, I get back to the sound. I, I think there's a profound truth in that somewhere, but. Um, I bought stones. Mm -hmm. So I could use them to hit together. Michael <laughs> brought uh, grass and he blew through the grass and he made a sound that way. Others sang and a few of us danced and we all, uh, you know, we had sticks. Some brought in sticks. Um, yes, yeah, so it was very, very interesting how we managed to, to do that. And it gave us a profound um, connection for the moment anyway into nature. With the music. Yes, my musicology. Mm -hmm. mm. So we study the music of all cultures broadly, 
um, and one 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 of those modules was Aboriginal music. Yeah. Out of Western Sydney, that just reminded me of something we did in Down Swamp, going down to the waterway, making music. Yeah. One of uh, um, Carl Jung's major themes was the, the notion of the Heros Demos, of the sacred marriage. And in fact, he's last and probably his most important book was called uh, Mysterium Conjunctionis. That's the mystery of the conjunction, the mystery of the opposites joining together. And uh, it, it, it just struck me that there's some, some, some scope here for um, the healing that needs to take place between the first First peoples and the second peoples, uh, a, a type of marriage that needs to uh, occur. Um, I can remember a few years ago, we were doing a tour of the Catherine Gorge, and um, uh, the tour operator um, was an Aboriginal group, uh, a young, a young Aboriginal man. He, he was also a geologist. Uh, and as we were going along the gorge, he was telling us about the features of the gorge and, uh, and how it came to be the way it was, a natural history and so forth. But he had two stories. <clears throat> uh, one story was about how the rainbow serpent arrived and travelled down this particular area and dug this very large uh, ditch uh, and the water stream there and the, the lane rainbow servant was still there in one particular the deep water hole but didn't want to be disturbed <clears throat> but he told that story with uh, the same sort of conviction and understanding that he gave us <clears throat> that he gave the geological uh, uh, exposition mm. for him they were both true mm. and yeah uh, but there's something important here <clears throat> about this, you know, and um, uh, the, 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 the notion of the sacred marriage. Uh, <clears throat> so Jung, like a lot of the other um, thinkers in this area, um, looks, at, looks at reality as a, a coincidence of opposites. And some of the medieval theologians define God as a, a complex of opposites. So if you like, the object of the universe is to move towards a reconciliation mm. of these. And, and this, it, this characteristic is seen in all cultures, the Egyptian, the, the Greek, the Roman, uh, Amero-Indian, uh, the notion of the opposites coming together, the notion of a marriage, a sacred marriage. And it just occurs to me that... Uh, this might be a really important aspect to take up in the issue of the relationships that we have with the Aboriginal people. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. That was. I think what you just said, sorry, what's your name? Uh, Terry. Terry, yeah. Um, yeah, because I was struggling to explain like just how meaningful that, that welcome to country in Alice Springs at the Gap was and when we were told about the caterpillar dreaming and you could you could almost see the hills kind of moving like that that sense of the, the formation of it so yeah that reminded me of um that story so thank you i 
I, I have a number of friends who are what's known as uh, ex-evangelicals, people who've left um, fundamentalist Christianity. And in the sort of example that Terry mentioned, they are taught that the, uh, that the biblical teaching and the scientific teaching are exclusive, that you can't believe them both. And that's a, it's a real source of trauma in, in people's lives because they have a, a story in the Bible that, uh, that gives them meaning. And uh, they're told that, well, this is a scientific story, you know, that you have to believe it literally. And you have to, uh, you know, reject anybody who says, oh, you know, that's, that's not true. Like, uh, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a source of trauma that, you know, we, we can't hold uh, multiple stories in our minds at, at once. And, and speaking, Terry, of the uh, sacred marriage of opposites, one of the great examples of that is in the uh, Chinese tradition of, uh, of Taoism with uh, the yin and the yang symbol of light and dark as, uh, as equal opposites that, are, that interpenetrate each other. And when you get to the ultimate point of light, then you enter into the dark and, and vice versa. So this cyclic vision of of reality as this, which i think the dadiri idea picks up in what the text was talking about the uh, the waiting for the seasons and just seeing uh, just living within the seasons again something one of the problems that we have is this alienation from nature so uh, so recovering a sense of being part of nature and seeing the cycles of light and dark and all, all the cycles of nature is just so important to healing and wholeness. They're thinking of the seasons in the, uh, on, on the ABC's website at the moment, there's a story from Western Australia uh, and the Aboriginal community in, around the Albany area. Um, I don't know its Indigenous name. But the Indigenous people there have put together a guidebook, I think, to the area, the environment of the area, and they talk about six seasons mm -hmm. in your, <laughs> this year. I was intrigued. I only read it this morning. Um, so you have early summer, late summer, early spring, late spring, and variously uh, you get to six seasons out of that. And it's another way of looking uh, and oh excuse me and they know when the seasons change mm. by the grass by the birds and of course by the weather and it's a very different way to our thinking is on the 21st day of the mm. seasons will change and I just, when you mentioned that uh, I, I just thought seasons there's something to be welded together between indigenous knowledge and our western knowledge can I just add to that, that that our own bodies do actually change too? If everyone really thinks about it, um, I noticed just recently that we were coming into autumn because my body started to change and start to have a few different symptoms and different ways of, of, of it being. And I don't think we're, we're made aware, we, we are aware of... <sighs> Gosh, you know, I work, a lot of people forget that they aren't just a body, but they're a mind as well. And there's a connection, a deep connection, and that we are a part of the earth too. We're not above it, we're part of it. And it's all integral to that. So I think it's a lovely idea to succeed. Yeah. I uh, the, the notion we saw there, frequent mainstream type references to the to the six or, or more seasons, that was sort of as I say became mainstream, where the um, uh, winter, spring, summer, autumn cycle that we have is obviously quite inappropriate in, in a lot of tropical type situations, and uh, that's something that we have taken into the mainstream really from Aboriginal culture there very appropriately, I think.
to dairy has got a lot of relevance for climate change as well, with the coming to terms with <coughs> listening to the, with the, the changes that we think about the impact of the floods in this more and the things people are going through to come to terms with that. Speaking of climate change, I think uh, one of the things that, that comes out of some of these philosophies is the sense that the earth is a lot more fragile and sensitive than our um, society has, has imagined and just that we have to have a lot more respect for the earth. And also we can think of our planet as a whole. That's something that I think is very difficult for us. You know, we, we're so caught up. The other thing about the dairy, as I understand it, is we are so caught up in being busy that we don't have time to just stop and, and contemplate and, and, and think and uh, so taking that time to reflect can really um, give us, cause us to give pause about the, the ethics and, and morality of our lives and something like, oh, what does it mean to say that our planet is fragile? Now, uh, that's something that a lot of people would just ignore, but if, if we can take a more contemplative approach, then we can start to, to understand that and we can start to think, well, what do we actually need to do to recognise climate change and do something about it? Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for participating. It's just been really lovely how willing everyone's been to, to experience this. So, um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, um, Carol, for um, coming coming along tonight and giving us a lot of so, <coughs> a lot of things to think about um, tonight and um, and all the Aboriginal um, work that's been done with the voices, voices now in our parliament and in our society. How important it is to um, recognise um, the the Indigenous people and their strengths and that they can bring a lot to our lives. You can see that in the schools where we go to the Indigenous artists are coming in and working with the students. Um, in a lot of schools have beautiful artworks. So um, it's pretty amazing to see that. I'd like to thank for your presentation tonight. And there's a little token um, to say thank you. Thank you. Um, also, um, next next month is Robbie Tulip, our friend over here, is coming to speak to us. Do you want to say something? Do you want to talk about? <coughs> his views on uh, on, on relating psychology to uh, to religion and society, and um, so I, I really look forward to sharing that with you. And I've, I've been reading a couple of books about um, Jung's relationship to to Christianity, and uh, and this sense of uh, how a philosophy of wholeness can be used uh, to to interpret some of the, the problems that we have in religion and uh, and uh, transform and and reform our, our thinking about spirituality so i look forward to sharing that with you next week next month that'll be like five weeks because of course this is a week earlier this time because of good friday next week go on to the uh the Young society website you can see uh, a number of articles and recordings of 
from his previous presentations. One of them on uh, uh, Jung's answer to Job, you might find quite interesting and relating a little bit to this. Also, I'd like to say something to Kirsten. Um, she's been working at our church, uniting the church. Mindfulness, meditation, of course. We're up to we're up to week five now, isn't it? That's right. Oh, week six. Six, because it's an eight-week course. So um, would you like to come and so? <clears throat> okay, I'd like to call on Terry. Um, you'd like to come up and tell us a little bit about your tarot? Can you, can you do that or is it there? Okay, if you like a phone. This is another uh, workshop experience coming up. So, Terry, Terry and I have been talking. <laughs> Terry and I have been talking about, um, about um, his tarot. Um, and we thought maybe he could come to our church because we have a very nice room, very inviting room to talk about um, his tarot, um, to run a course on tarot, tarot reading. Do you want to talk a little bit more? So we'll probably have a Sunday afternoon, but we've been doing with the mindfulness. It seems to work well with people. And it's a very snug, nice room that we have there. And we can have an afternoon tea as well. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? You know, you've heard of tarot cards? <laughs> well, <laughs> they're not just working out for um, if you're going to win the Melbourne Cup next week or not. But there are a series of, of images or, or pictures. And uh, I've been working with them for at least 10 years now. And uh, it, it, it's sort of very relevant to the sorts of things we were talking about today. <coughs> because we're really talking about the soul of the country. And the, the, the tarot cards are a bit like a telephone system. <clears throat> they, they allow you to connect with your soul because they present a series of, of images that, that relate to all the archetypal influences that affect our life journey. Uh, and... Uh, it's really important to be in dialogue with our soul in our life journey. One of the things that Carl Jung regretted very much was that he spent too much of his time um, studying the soul. <clears throat> and towards the end of it all, he said, I've wasted all this time. Uh, instead of studying the soul, I should have been entering into a relationship with it. So <clears throat> the... the Reading the cards can help you in your relationship, your discussion with your soul. And uh, a, a nice book that um, the, the psychoanalyst uh, James Hillman wrote called um, the, uh, the Soul Code or, or the Character Code. So James Hillman writes about this notion that um, our... Uh, uh, now, our life is a bit like an acorn. Uh, just like a, an acorn has the whole potential story of the life of the coming oak tree in it, so too we have an acorn. <clears throat> and he, he likens our soul to that acorn. And so the, and we need to be in dialogue with it and listen to it, just like we need to listen to the country. And anyway, the, the, the workshop 
I think it'll run for about five weeks and people will need to have a tarot deck. Um, there are many decks, dozens of tarot decks, but I just happen to use one called the Rider Weight deck. Uh, and uh, the, the, the course would involve uh, getting to understand how the cards are being used and to understand the, <clears throat> the sort of cosmology that's associated with the philosophy of the tarot. And again, it's very much like um, the Aboriginal uh, notion of divinity. We spoke about numinosity and the, the notion that numinosity above all is a connection with the divine. And um, the Aboriginal notion, notion of a dreaming time as an origin uh, of mother earth. That's very much behind the notion of a tarot cast. Anyway, enough of that. But uh, so that'll last for about five weeks. And I don't know, it might cost you eight bucks a head or something like that. Then. Might be 10. Might be 10. Thanks very much, Jerry. We look forward to Jerry was trained by a very special lady in Melbourne. And it's your friend, isn't it? And she came here. She came here a few years back. And we had a lot of people that were interested in, um, in that course. In the yeah, in the, yeah, thank you. We'll talk more. I'd like to say thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's ended up being a very interesting night. Um, and thank you, Carolyn, for initiating um, this talk and for coming along because it's been a very good evening. And um, thank you. And we look forward to Robbie coming along next month and with Terry. It's also, we'll send you some information because we've got to put it together for Terry's talk. Okay, all the best and have a good evening and have a good weekend. And we'll see you next month. And happy Easter to everybody. <laughs>